And the day I was reading some comments made by a Vipassana teacher who'd gone over to Asia and studied at a couple of monasteries. And he commented, he said, the lay people over there, as far as he could see, they didn't have much of a practice. They just came in support of the monastery, which is a peculiar thing to say. As if Buddhist practice were just practicing mindfulness, practicing meditation. Supporting a monastery is also a practice, observing the precepts, developing all sorts of good qualities in the mind. These are all part of the practice. When the Buddha gave his summary of the teachings, the not doing of any evil. the full development of skillfulness, the cleansing of the mind. These are the Buddhist teachings. All of those things are part of the practice. All of those things are part of the path. So it's important that we understand this, that we're not just here to meditate or to master the, the techniques. We're also here to develop good qualities in the mind all around. Because these are our treasures. The Buddha talks of them as treasures. The kind of treasure, he says, that fire can't burn, water can't wash away, thieves can't steal. And it may sound like spiritual materialism, but hey, it's better to be spiritually wealthy than spiritually poor. Because if you're spiritually poor, you look around for your happiness in other places. There's a traditional list of what the seven treasures are. Start with conviction. Conviction in the Buddha's awakening, conviction in the principle of karma. You're convinced that the Buddha really did discover that there is a deathless, and it really is possible to do that through his it was possible for him to do that through his own actions. That's his discovery of the fourth type of karma, the one that leads to the end of karma. That's what we're convinced really happened, that he was really able to do it. And it wasn't any special quality of his that pertained only to him alone that enabled him to do it. As he said, it was based on qualities of being resolute, ardent, mindful, all things that everybody can develop if they put their minds to it. So what this comes down to is you have to look very carefully at what you do all the time, because that's where you're going to learn this path. If you spend all your time in abstractions. You miss the path. You don't see the path happening right in front of you. So you're going to be careful about what you do, what you say, what you think, because these things have consequences. And if you're very careful, you find a level of action that takes you beyond the consequences. But in order to develop that sort of precision, that kind of skill. You have to work on ordinary, everyday actions. What you do, what you say, how you interact with other people around you, the work you take up around the monastery. This is important. John Fuang often commented on how clean and meticulous a John Mun was. Everything was very well cared for. Everything was very kept very clean. even living out in the forest, especially living out in the forest. You've got to be clean and neat, because otherwise the forest starts taking over. So it starts from very simple things like that, taking care of your surroundings. And as you take care of surroundings, it also works to take care of your mind. The next principle is virtue. Abstaining from anything that's going to cause harm. 
We've got the five precepts, we've got the eight, the ten, 227. And they've gone through all the, the minor rules. They're there for a purpose, to develop qualities of the mind. And at the same time, they create a good environment around you. In the sense that if you don't do harm, harm doesn't come to you. And it's a lot easier to live in a society and to live in a group where you're principled in your behavior. Other people are less put upon. There's less sense of revenge or retaliation that goes back and forth. So it creates a good environment around you and a good environment inside. This is one of John Munn's major complaints about how the Dharma was being packaged in Bangkok in his day and age. Precepts were defined simply in terms of your actions and your words. That was it. As if it simply had to do with externals. As he pointed out many, many times, that the essence of virtue is in the intention. The intention is a quality of mind. Virtue is a quality of mind. So it's a quality you want to ensconce in your mind, because it makes life easier for you and for the people around you. To back it up, there are two other treasures, Hirdi, which is translated as shame. But it can also be translated as self-esteem, in the sense that it's not that you're ashamed of yourself, but you regard yourself in a good light, such a good light that when lower behavior or lower thoughts occur to you, you realize that that's not becoming to you. You're above that. You would be ashamed to do those things. That's a quality of self-esteem, self-respect. And then there's otapat, which can be translated as concern, translated as, sometimes it's translated as fear of the consequences of evil. In other words, you care about care enough about yourself that you wouldn't want to do anything that would cause suffering. You care enough about the people around you that you wouldn't want to do anything to cause suffering. And you're afraid of the dangers that your actions could bring about if they were unskillful. It's a healthy kind of fear. Another treasure is learning. Listening, reading, learning what you can from the wisdom of the past, so that you don't have to keep reinventing the Dharma wheel all the time. As the Buddha once said, listening to the Dharma gains all kinds of benefits. Things you didn't understand before, you begin to understand. Things you never heard of before, you hear. Things you may have heard of that you understood a little bit, you listen to them again, you get to think about them again. Your doubts are put to rest, your views are straightened out, and your mind becomes radiant. That's how you, Those are the benefits that come listen, from listening to the real Dharma. In other words, it brings it, your mind to peace. And that's just in a soft, reassuring way. Sometimes it's kind of chastising. But again, there's a sense of peace that comes when you realize that you've been careless in your actions. And it's brought to your attention. And the mind pulls back from its carelessness. That can also make the mind radiant. The sixth treasure is renunciation. Excuse me, relinquishment. Learning how to give things up. Realizing that in giving things up, it's not self deprivation, there's a trade. Our different goals, our different aims in life can pull in lots of different directions. And there's one school of thought that encourages people to excel in all directions. 
But the question is, is that possible? Some things you've got to give up if you want something of higher value. In particular, learning how to give up particular comforts, pastimes that waste your time in meditation, because you don't want the habit of mind that's constantly looking for instant gratification, or is always ready to relax all the time. You don't want that kind of habit to be in charge of your mind. A healthy sense of self-regard, a healthy sense of self-esteem requires that you make whatever sacrifices are needed for your own true benefit. The clearer you, an idea you have of what really is your true benefit, the more obvious it becomes what things are getting in the way, what things are not, what things need to be given up. Which chess pieces have to be sacrificed in order for you to reach checkmate? And at the same time, you develop good qualities in the mind, especially in terms of giving up material things. The mind becomes a lot more spacious. If you're concerned about keeping this and keeping that and hanging on to this and hanging on to that, so many things could happen to threaten those desires. Then your mind gets more and more narrow, more and more confining, because it's locked onto these things for fear that something will happen that will take them away. But if the mind learns to realize that these things are going to have to go someplace, sometime, And that you gain the sense of generosity that comes from seeing that other people may need them and you happily give them away. Your mind becomes a lot more open. It becomes a much more spacious mind. And that's a kind of mind that's a lot easier to live in. This is one of the immediate rewards that come from relinquishment. And the seventh treasure is discernment, wisdom. This is probably the most important of all seven. As John Lee once said, if you have wisdom and discernment, then if you're born poor, all you have is a machete to your name, he says. You can still establish yourself in the world. And on the other side, you've got, you've got all the advantages of the world in terms of birth, wealth, education. But if you don't have real discernment, real wisdom, those things can turn around and hurt you. There's that blessing, Ayutwa no Sukhambalan, long life, happiness, strength, beauty. No other what blessings that wish for for wealth and a position of influence. These things are dangerous if you don't have discernment. They can turn around and cut your throat. I learned this evening of a young woman I met several years back. Very good looking. And it turns out that she's a kleptomaniac. And it's destroyed all our relationships. It's destroyed the family. The family's been her family parents have been sued to the tune of seven million baht over her behavior in the past. Here she is. The family was wealthy. She's good looking, but she used those things to hurt not only herself but the people around her. And this is a case of what happens when you have the benefits of what's usually thought of as meritorious behavior: good, good look, good looks, wealth. But you don't have the discernment to use them properly. So this is what keeps all the other treasures safe, keeps them in line so they don't turn on you. Having a strong sense of 
what is for your own long-term welfare and happiness. And learn to regard all the other things that come your way in the light of that insight. So when other things tempt you, you learn to look at them in the larger picture. So when greed, anger, and delusion come, when lust and fear come, you don't believe them. You look, at, you, you find that these things focus on only a very narrow picture, a very narrow slice of life, and they almost willfully block out everything else, so that whatever you desire looks really good, or whatever you hate looks really bad. But discernment is a quality. That opens you up to look at things in terms of the larger picture. You ref refuse to allow the mind to block things out. You learn how to look through your denial, look through those walls that the mind puts up around the things that it wants or the things that it hates, so you can see the whole picture. In particular, the whole picture of what happens if you act on those desires. Where will it lead you? Will it lead you where you want to go? And you have the wisdom not only to see this, but also the wisdom to figure out ways to pull yourself away from what you would enjoy doing, but you know is going to lead to bad results, or things that you don't enjoy doing, but you know they'll lead to good results. You have the wisdom to talk yourself into how to do the latter, to stick with whatever whatever is required to lead to that true happiness, no matter how easy or difficult it may be. That's a part of discernment as well. Not just the seeing of it, the goal that you want, but also understanding the ins and outs of your own mind so that you can talk yourself into letting go of your desires that lead away from your true goal, and talk yourself into doing what you really need to do. So this, of all the treasures, is probably the most important. But they all work together. It's important, it's important that you realize that anything you do that helps develop these qualities in your mind, that's all part of your practice. So you don't think the practice is just how you do when you're do doing formal meditation. It's the way you live your whole life. And when the practice is complete, then you achieve what's called completion. Buddha's last word was sambhati, sambhati ta. Become consummate. In other words, fulfilling the teachings in an all-around way, mastering them in an all-around way. The more complete the causes, the more complete the results.